We use this right now, sorry. Uh, I was really uh, uh, surprised um, when, when, when I received the call that, uh, <clears throat> that I, would, I would be uh, getting this award this year. And it was really uh, an honor <clears throat> to get it. And also, I, I, I must say, uh, to be included in a group that included Aaron Schwartz and uh, Glenn Greenwald and uh, Laura, uh, uh, I'm always afraid of considering her last name wrong, but what's your case? Individuals who have been concerned about justice, power, knowledge, and equality. And that was, but particularly this year, I mean, to be included with them was, was a, a real bonus for me. So I, I'd like to uh, thank you, EFF, for this award. Thank you for that beautiful introduction, really. Uh, uh, I, I was trying to figure out what I was going to say today, because we, you know, I've, I've worked a long time in this field. Uh, we've accumulated a lot of different projects that we do over the years. And so, uh, I was trying to think, do I want to sort of speed read through what we're working on, or what we've done, or different things. And I, I thought what I'd start with, though, and mostly talk about is this treaty that was just concluded. Because uh, I think that's why I got the board this year. And I, I think it's important. And uh, it's, it's an interesting story. If you bear with me, I, I'm going to read my notes and it won't, won't be as funny as I honestly can't think of it. I've been fortunate to have a job that allows me to pursue these, these type of topics including the work over the past five years to advance the UN Treaty, the Marrakesh Treaty, copyright exceptions for persons who are blind or, or have other disabilities. I'd like to acknowledge the uh, important role of EFF in the negotiation, beginning with the early work of Cory Doctorow and, and Gwen Hines. I think Gwen is here. Um, and, and a series of other people, all of whom were awesome when they sent there because we had like many different people come from the EFF over the years that I've seen at Wyco and, and, and every one of them has, has really been a, a hit with the delegates and added so much to the negotiations. Um, uh, Corey and, and, and what I mentioned is in the very beginning they were really uh, uh, instrumental in this reform Wyco uh, initiative uh, and this access to knowledge within, within Wyco which was picked as, Wyco was picked as kind of the a hard target at the time. We decided that uh, uh, we would we would go after the, the sort of the citadel, the church of the IP community, you know, and that was a well published property organization. Really, in 2002, 2003, Larry Lessig, I think he, he was one of the people who signed a letter to Francis Curry uh, uh, asking that he won't be in an open source technology. He said, which has been many since then, but was just completely, completely shocked at the time. And that's where this, really, the origins of this was. Um, and, uh, and working with all sorts of organizations, both blind and sighted, uh, who supported efforts to improve access uh, for blind persons. For those who have not followed the treaty negotiations, I'll explain some basics. Uh, technology has created new opportunities to expand access for blind persons, including, for example, refreshable braille, large print screens, digital text-to-speech readers, and new data formats that are particularly useful for persons with disabilities, such as open DAISY format for electronic books. Uh, with the right technology, some blind persons are able to read more than 400 words per minute, scan and annotate text, copy and share information. Since much reading material is not designed to be accessible to a blind person, it may be in some cases completely inaccessible, or at other times it's really hard to use. And we had a person in America, as we talked about, having to read a whole page over and over and over again just to get to a footnote because of the way that electronic data was formatted. And to make works more accessible and usable, libraries of the blind, such as Bookshare, Jim Fruchtman is a big player in this whole thing, is in the front here. Uh, have made digital copies of works, broken digital locks when necessary, republishing information in a variety of ways. And so technology has been playing an important and mostly positive role. But the global legal system is presenting barriers 
really stupid barriers. And these were well known, but they were ignored for many decades. Under copyright law, making and distributing works in accessible formats requires either permission from copyright holders or an exception to the law. Since permissions are often difficult or impossible to obtain, exceptions play an important role. Only a third of the countries with copyright laws have such exceptions in their national law. In some countries, exceptions are narrow, for example, limited only to the use of Braille. Those countries that do have exceptions often treat them, normally treat them, as national rather than global. As a consequence, when uh, a version is created under a copyright exception in the United States, we do not share that accessible version with a blind person in Canada, or a blind person in the UK, or a blind person in Australia, or Kenya, or India, or in any other country. The same thing is true in Latin America and other places. Uh, or, you know, the, the half, half European population, uh, more than half reads English these days, so it's really not just white, white, white languages. But, uh, and all these countries, they, they just try to replicate what they do. It's, it's, it's actually a, lot, a fair amount of work to do high quality versions of some works. And not that much gets done anyway, but really it's crazy to have every country in this sort of system of autarky. And the amount of disparity is really, really radically different. The US has hundreds of thousands of books for the blind. Uh, when I was in Uruguay, they had 3,000 in the National Library. And they had a, a microphone in a studio. I asked them how many books do they, they do every year. And, and they said they did 50 the previous year. It's about one a week. They have a volunteer come in and read it to a microphone and make a, an audio version of the book. And that's what they did. Across the river in Argentina, they had tens of thousands in Argentina to fully roast, but they were not sharing it for a way. In some countries in Central America, less than 500 books made available for, for blind people. Most of the people we talked to that, that went to college, that became lawyers, and got their PhDs and things, we asked them how they did it in, 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 in India or in Kenya, different places talk to them, they come to Waipo and talk about it, and they'd say that their father would read the books, or a person, a, the, the, the digital reader they have was a person reading the book to them, because they didn't really have the, uh, the accessible works, but and often these things were really available in one country, but not in another country. So this, of course, is the stupid part of the law, um, that do not allow the cross-border sharing of works that are accessible blind Recognizing, of course, that hey, it's, it's like a zero economic market for the publishers. There's no real money involved. And you've already got an exception to the national law, so it's actually a lawful thing to make the copy in the first place. But they do it in such a way that it has the minimum benefit to blind people around the world and a very disparate, a very negative effect on people that live where 90% of the blind people live in developing countries where things are really tough. Well, the Marrakesh Treaty sought to solve both problems to ensure that every country had minimum exceptions for the blind, but also that those works were created in an accessible format in one country and could be copied and used by blind persons around the world. Um, the negotiations began with an experts meeting in July 2008, convened by KAI, my organization, and the World Blind Union in Washington, D.C. Jim Fruchtman, the minister, was at that meeting. It took almost five years to complete the treaty. It should have been a short time, but because it was the first user rights treaty in copyright, sometimes it's not really a bonus to be an innovator. <laughs> the negotiations became extraordinarily difficult. Not only did book publishers and journal publishers and collection societies rally against um, uh, um, the treaty, but so too did the motion picture industry including companies such as Viacom and Paramount, Disney, Fox, Time Warner. Plus, and this was quite surprising to us, just in 2013, a large number of big companies concerned with patent rights led by General Electric, but also Exxon, Monsanto, Caterpillar, people that do bulldozers and things, uh, Glaxo, Philips, and Adobe, uh, uh, lobbying against the treaty on the grounds that it would, it would sort of rock the entire if this little treaty for the blind and be able to share books to their exception across from Canada and the United States was going to rock the whole intellectual property department and, 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 and just destroy everything. 
Uh, and then the next thing you know, there'd be no patents on, uh, on uh, anything. <laughs> I'm serious, you have to be honest. <laughs> uh, Senator Lady's office was called to pick and they said, we're getting calls from General Electric, what's going on? You know, it's like they couldn't believe it. And, uh, but I will say that Microsoft, Google, and Intel quite, quite pointedly distanced themselves from what, uh, you know, they're actually, the names were actually on some letter that went out, and they went on the record and said, no, not them. And they were actually really appalled by that, to their credit. Microsoft was the first one, actually, uh, to take that position. And Google quickly, same position. <laughs> um, so, standing uh, between blind people and a fixed stupidity in the global copyright system, were some of the most powerful and helpful companies on the planet. So the Obama administration, the European Union, were most primarily focused on the right holders in the negotiation. The Obama administration spent years trying to derail the treaty in favor of weaker voluntary measures and demanded that deaf persons and audiovisual works be excluded from the treaty. The Department of State lobbied African countries to abandon language in the treaty on fair use. Among developing countries, there was strong support for a strong treaty. And under high income countries, after a while it was a split. Initially they were all opposed to the treaty. But then the conservative government of the UK came out in favor of the treaty. That was the first break in Europe. And before you knew it, Japan, uh, Australia, all these countries were opposing the United States position in the negotiation, which was really helpful because the minute you sort of broke that block of high income countries, uh, things went better. The European Parliament uh, uh, had about a half dozen hearings as opposed to zero in the U.S. Congress on this issue. And all political parties supported the treaty, largely due to the work of the European Blind Union and David Hammerstein and, 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 and uh, Dak D. And despite some regrettable failures, such as exclusion of deaf persons demanded by the United States government as a concession to the film industry, uh, my mother's death, and so this was not something I, I thought was really a, 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 a profile of courage for the Obama administration. Um, uh, much was accomplished and a just cause prevailed. And the fact that it was a just cause was obvious to almost everyone involved in negotiations. I think Jim, Jim remembers this. You're sitting there in a room, and people come in and they have hard positions, they're very tough, they're in the negotiations, and there's a bunch of blind people. The open Society, Air France, were able to sort of manage the travel fund. A lot of blind people were attending the negotiations. And when you go into the bathroom and you see a blind person trying to find a urinal or to wash his hands, or you watch people trying to cross in a, in a town that they don't live in, and it's heartbreaking. And they watch people struggling to read basic things and, 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 and listening to them trying to use the different technologies they have. The hardest hearted people in the negotiation became less hard hearted every day, every minute, every hour they spent really uh, with these people. And so and some of the right owners kind of dialed it back a notch, they kind of mailed it in and really didn't give it their A level lobbying effort. <laughs> and many people just became committed to a solution. They really wanted it to happen. I have lobbyists talk to me, they say things like, well, um, yeah, I'm a lobbyist to be, you know, in the film industry, but I'm also a human being. And that, that's my way to It was a, an incredibly dramatic uh, negotiation. It was, uh, we were out in the desert, we walked in there, we came into the negotiation with 48, 48, I mean, 88 brackets in the text, which are areas of disagreement. Almost nothing was agreed upon. For the first five days, the United States wouldn't agree upon how many countries, I mean, on what day you could sign the treaty, or how many countries could sign, or anything like that. And then the Washington Post ran a full page story uh, that they put on the web on Saturday that, you know, detailed 142 pages of emails between the Motion Picture Association and the Obama administration about the treaty. Uh, uh, and then the very same day, uh, Jim had called up uh, Stevie Wonder, and Stevie Wonder had put a video out saying, he will come to Marrakesh and be there and play a concert for negotiators to complete the treaty. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we flew a guy named Brendan Toller in, and he was a, a 
documentary filmmaker, and we said, Brendan, your job is to shoot footage and make people believe you are making a documentary film. <laughs> Very effective. Last time we had since everyone when the documentary was coming out. So there's, there's lots of smoke and mirrors going, there's a lot of human violence. One of the persons on our team actually went blind during the negotiation of free <laughs> Seriously, it wasn't a joke. I mean, it, was, it was a tremendous medical problem. But that was it was also a reminder to a lot of the people there on the ground that they were one accident away you know, one point in their life away from experiencing the same problem. Um, one of the main negotiators who wrote by that's what happened, he was 20 years old, somebody threw acid in his face and he was blind out. You know, people, but they heard so many of these stories, it was quite moving. Well, I have a long list of people I, I wanted to thank, and, you know, I, yeah, you need to do this because, you know, it's, it's boring to have people there, but the people, they like, you know, Remember, you know, part of it now. So, just, just like I speak through just a few, but from the world mining and Dan Paskin, Mary Ann Diamond, uh, Chris Friend, and Judy Friend really did a fabulous job of leadership from South Africa, Jason Aaron, Marcus Lowe uh, from Argentina, uh, uh, Pablo Lacuna from People Leaders. I mean, I only mentioned about 5% of the important people. Jonathan Van, working with the library, did a fabulous job. Uh, I mentioned David Hammerstein, uh, Third World Network, uh, uh, sure I got uh, the Swiss government, from our staff group, <laughs> Mano Ress, uh, my wife, uh, Krista uh, Fox, uh, the Brazil delegation, the Ecuador delegation, the African, the entire African, the Ruth Okajia, who was fabulous in the negotiation, and actually the U.S. government tried to intervene to get Ruth Okajia removed from the Nigerian delegation because she was too good. <laughs> But it didn't work. I mean, she stayed in the delegation. Uh, Judy Rios is a former EFF person you know, that, that, that uh, went to many of the early negotiations and showed up in Marrakesh, even though she's now working for Doctors Without Borders to be there. This was a fabulous moment in my life. I think everyone that worked on it. Thank you very much, EFF, for the award. Thanks for the opportunity to, to share this story. Thank you.